All right, I think we will get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here to uh, the second in this semester's Westgrid seminar series. Today's talk is on Compute Canada's Globus portal, fast user-friendly data transfer and sharing. Uh, it's going to be brought to us by Jason Laddie from the University of, Sask University of Saskatchewan. Jason has a background in chemistry and computer science. He's also the site lead for Westgrid at the University of Saskatchewan. And he's also two-time Western Canadian Scrabble champion. Uh, I will pass it on to Jason. Great. Thanks, Todd. I owe you one for a future time. Um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the, the Globus portal. Um, in addition to being the Westgrid site lead, I've also been able to uh, work on the Globus project as the chair of the work Compute Canada Working Group on Globus for the last 10 months or so, and um, hoping to be able to present a tool to you that you can take advantage of in, in, as you conduct your research. So I wanted to start with a little slide on motivation. And um, the, the questions that we're trying to answer here or solutions we're trying to find are for basically for moving and sharing data. So the first use case. I need to easily, quickly, and reliably move or mirror uh, portions of my data to other places. And that could be a Compute Canada uh, HPC cluster. It could be uh, one of your campus file systems. It could be a lab server, which you have connected to some sort of instruments. It could be a personal laptop or workstation. The uh, need remains the same. You have data in one place, you need to get it to another place. Globus also helps to answer the, the problem, I need to easily and securely share my data with, with my colleagues um, at other institutions or within the same institution for that matter. And, um, you know, these both sort of more broadly fall into I need a good way to store, backup, archive, transfer my research data. So that's the motivation behind um, looking into Globus and developing a Compute Canada Globus service. So, the highlights of Globus. Uh, Globus is software as a service, which is to say that it's not installed and running uh, and developed by Compute Canada, but rather we've partnered with Globus, which is a not-for-profit organization uh, based out of the University of Chicago and partnered with Argonne National Labs in the United States. Um, Globus runs the, the back-end infrastructure which enables this sort of uh, high-speed and, and reliable file transfer. And Compute Canada, including Westgrid, uh, configure their systems in order to take advantage of the service. So Globus operates the service, and we have over, uh, well, nearly 25 Compute Canada sites are connected within our Globus network or Globus portal, as we refer to it right now. So what it offers is um, file transfer and, and replication, um, which is more reliable, more convenient, uh, it's secure, and it's high performance transfer, which is really important when we're dealing with amounts of data at the Compute Canada, uh, Compute Canada scale, which often go into the terabyte and petabyte regions. And also, uh, file sharing is, is a possibility. You can share files with collaborators who don't actually have Compute Canada accounts, and in some cases this makes a lot of sense. If you've just finished a lot of um, uh, computations and you want to be able to share the results, with a certain set of people or you want to make some of your data available to, to collaborators who might want to replicate that data, it might be useful in order to do so. And they might not want to go through the uh, entire process of becoming a full Compute Canada user or they may not be eligible. So the uh, primary entry point to this is the Compute Canada Globus portal, which is a website at globus.computecanada.ca. And this is a screenshot of it. Um, I will be endeavoring to do a live demo in, in, in the face of uh, the law of demos, which is uh, whenever you try and demonstrate something, in general it will fail. But I will try and do three demonstrations later on today. Um, I've got the, the Globus Portal screenshot here, and basically it starts, uh, it, it's a, a, this is operated by, uh, by Globus, but it is our Compute Canada site. And um, we have it uh, you know, themed according to the Compute Canada um, look and feel presently, and that look and feel may change in the future, and we have control over that. So we do have to start to use Globus by getting a Globus account. Um, now, a Globus account is separate and distinct from your Compute Canada account. 
it could be the same username or different. But in general, um, you know, you're going to have to you're going to have to select a Globus username, and that identifies you to the Globus service. Now, I had mentioned that Globus is hosted in the United States, so your username that you pick, which could definitely be uh, personally identifying, particularly if, if it's your name. I've used Haladi as my Globus uh, account name, and that identifies me at least within a narrow set of people who might be using this. So that is stored in the, in the United States, as is um, my Globus password. A key point here which I do want to bring up is that research data does not travel through Globus. So what happens is Globus is basically a broker for you. It helps you uh, get a point-to-point -point connection between the place where your files are currently stored and the place where you want to end up uh, transferring your files to. So if both of those are in Canada or, say, on Compute Canada resources, you would not be transferring any data through the United States, for example. So that's, a, that's an important point. The other thing I'll just mention quickly is that Globus is currently English only. Um, we're, we're looking into getting some more uh, bilingual features going. Uh, in the future, and I'll, I'll talk about that very briefly at the very end. So it's quite easy to get a Globus account actually on the Compute Canada uh, login page. So you go to globus.computecanada.ca, and there's a, actually if I can sit back here, right around here there's a sign in with, sign up with Globus button which you can click, and that will bring you to this page. Um, and it, all, all it asks for is a full name and email at which you can be reached, a username, and then a password. And um, at the very top of the, uh, of the, right underneath the sign up logo, it says this, this file service is made available via Globus and um, just reminds you of what I had already told you, which is that uh, if you choose to use your name um, as your account name, then that could be personally identifying and that information would be stored outside of Canada. Um, and then to log in, you just simply use your account and password, uh, the account name that you just set up, and your Globus password. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the service itself. The idea behind um, Globus and, and data transfer gives you a number of things above and beyond what you could get from using uh, something like SCP. Um, the service does what we call fire and forget transfers, and I'll get a little bit more into that, but basically so that you don't have to babysit them. Um, it, it, it has automatic fault recovery. There are a bunch of advanced features that you can take advantage of. There's a GUI so that you can uh, transfer files using a graphical interface rather than typing arcane commands at the command line. If you like arcane commands at the command line, but there's also a powerful command line interface. And then there are also um, APIs available in case you want to be customizing things so that no one needs to be typing anything at all. Uh, there's also good uh, built-in security uh, available so that you can, with the click of a button, encrypt uh, your transfers if, if it's necessary. So the basic idea is in the cartoon on the right. You start with one where we have a user initiating a transfer request and they could do that through the GUI or the command line or the API, whatever. They initiate that request. That request goes to Globus. Then Globus um, begins brokering this point-to-point -point connection that I was talking about. So Globus goes out and contacts uh, the data source and you authenticate there. And it goes out and contacts the data destination and you authenticate there, assuming that you have access to both of those two places, your source and your destination. Then Globus goes through the process of actually moving and transferring those files for you. And then when it's all done, you get to step three, which is you get a notification, which is uh, typically an email, and also the notifications are logged within Globus. So Globus has some nice properties for an organization like Compute Canada and Westgrid. We're, uh, we're separated by thousands of kilometers, our, our various different sites that we might want to transfer to and from, and our researchers often want to transfer further. They want to go around the world, around the continent, around the world. <coughs> and Having high performance data transfer is, is very important to us also in the scale at which uh, many researchers work in the terabyte or, or petabyte scale uh, for data storage. So Globus uses Grid FTP uh, for high speed reliable data transfer and this Grid FTP has been developed by Globus actually for a, a long time. Uh, Westgrid has been using 
Red FTP for, for more than 10 years. Uh, with If you've ever used GCP, um, which is, is a script wrapper which, which goes around Grid FTP, but Globus now has developed an entire service around, um, rather than just providing the underlying tools, they're providing a service as well. So Grid FTP is an extension of standard file transfer protocol, FTP, um, but it has enhanced security. Um, it supports parallel transfers. So rather than doing a single transfer at a time about as fast as you can push it, it supports multiple TCP streams to take advantage of uh, our fast networks and, and make faster transfers possible. It also does automatic TCP optimization. So it turns out that TCP, while quite reliable, sometimes is a bit of a lousy performer over long distances and um, requires some tweaks and, and um, optimization. And Globus takes care of that optimization and negotiation for you. Uh, it's a nice way to take advantage of performance tuning without having to know much about it. And finally, Globus does fault, uh, has a good, good degree of fault tolerance. Um, it can tolerate network and server failure, and it supports automatic restart. Uh, if you've ever been in the position where you've tried to transfer 50 directories each with you know, 20 or 50 files in them, you know what a pain it is when you start a transfer and it conks halfway through, and, and more often than not, I think you find yourself just starting the whole transfer over again. And you know this is tolerable at the um, at smaller scales, but it's not such a great thing when you're trying to move um, hundreds of terabytes of data across the country. So I had alluded to fire and forget. Um, the the basic idea is you start a data transfer of uh, many files let's say, using your web browser and Globus. Uh, and then once you click the button which said initiate this transfer, then you can basically walk away from it. And you'll get an email letting you know when it's successfully completed or after a certain number of retries have happened, um, it will come back and, and let you know that there was a problem with the transfer. So there's no need to maintain a terminal connection or try and keep your terminal window open for an extended period of time or any of that sort of uh, that sort of thing. You don't need to keep the web page open once you've done that. You can open up a window, open up a browser window, start a transfer, initiate, a, uh, initiate the transfer, and then close up the window and begin uh, doing some of your other work. This philosophy is pretty common all the way through the through Globus, and uh, I'd like to think through Compute Canada is that we want to remove barriers to doing research and uh, have you spend more time thinking about your research problems and less time about the details of moving files around. So once you've uh, initiated that transfer request, then it's queued and handled by Globus. You could start a bunch of transfers and walk away from them all. And at the end of it, uh, you get uh, notification on things here. So this is too small to see, um, but this is my emergency in case um, the, uh, the demos don't work here. Uh, you can see check marks and X, X marks here. And basically, I've got a number of transfers which I had initiated from, uh, from point to point. And the two that I have X's beside are ones that I canceled because I decided that they were too long or, um, or something like that. If you're in the case where there was a failure, well, you'd actually be able to run down the details on it. And in here, this is a succeeded uh, transfer, which is completed in event log, which I was able to bring up through the browser. And I was able to see that I managed to transfer a, a file and, and you know, my effective speed is, is listed there. And there's a number of other pieces of, of data there. So I talked a little bit about fault recovery. Once the transfer is started, Globus monitors and automatically restarts any failed or stalled transfers. And um, it, if there's a problem which happens halfway through, you're transferring for hours or days maybe because it'll be a huge data set that you want to transfer. Something gets interrupted, there's a network interruption, your system crashes, whatever. Globus then resumes from the point of failure rather than you having to figure out what files have been transferred and what files haven't. Um, and it doesn't retransmit all of the data that you originally specified. So it's not like it said, oh, there was some sort of problem at 95%, let's start again. Uh, it just finishes with, with, with what needs to be uh, finished off. So there's no need to babysit your data transfer. And uh, I don't want to belabor this. I think it's very useful for transferring a large number of files or directories. In addition, there are some optional features which you can choose to enable depending on uh, the particulars of your use case. 
So mirroring is one example. Uh, there is an option available to sort of mimic the rsync. It's an rsync-like feature um, where you transfer only new and or changed files from a directory. So if you, if you wanted to go into a directory and be sure that it was synced up nicely with what you had on your home computer, uh, that would be possible. What you do is you'd um, click the um, uh, uh, click the mirroring option f uh, files, and and you are able to keep um, both in sync. So you can delete files on the destination if they don't exist on the source. You can keep file dates consistent at both ends, and that's sometimes useful because um, oftentimes you you want the permissions from your source and and the file dates from your source rather than um, it telling you, well, I transferred that, this file this morning, therefore this is the newest file which exists on the file system. By default, file verification at both ends is on. So uh, checksums are checked for matching both before and after a file transfer, and if they don't match, then the entire file is retransferred until that checksum passes on both ends, and if for whatever reason you transfer it, 11 e four times and they don't match at the end, uh, then it will return an error and let you know that there was a problem. But this greatly reduces the chance of you having some sort of silent corruption uh, in your file during transfer. Um, finally, there's also an optional encryption that you can do. So if you want to be sure that the file that you're transferring over, let's say it's sensitive, um, you can click the button which says encrypt transfer. And I won't go into the details of the encryption. That's well documented at the Globus site. And if you need encryption, I'd encourage you to take a look at the details of the encryption methodology before you go about and do it. But um, one thing we have noticed is that you get lower performance while it's um, encrypting on a fly. And it, it's a reasonably serious penalty um, in speed. So um, sort of maybe 50%. Um, so your transfer might take twice as long. But there are cases where you would want to encrypt your transfer. All right, so I've talked about some of the features about Globus. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about what a Globus endpoint is and um, what exactly uh, the, the, the places that you move files between. So an endpoint is basically, from a user, user perspective, some place that you can transfer to or from using Globus. It's, it's a logical address for a grid FTP server. Uh, it's similar to like a domain name for a web server. And it takes the form of a username, and then the pound sign, or Octothorpe, and then uh, the endpoint name. So you can set up endpoints on a lot of, on a variety of different systems. And again, when I was talking about the use cases in the first places, Anywhere you can create an endpoint is, or have an endpoint created for you is a place that you can use Globus uh, to transfer to or from. So that includes Compute Canada and West Grid systems and clusters, um, your local research servers, uh, workstations for scientific instruments, um, desktops and laptops. There, there's a lot of variety available. Now, all Compute Canada systems, including all WestGrid systems, can be found under Compute Canada um, and then pound system name. So we've, things are organized at the system name level. So for example, if you're trying to get to the Bugaboo cluster, you can go to Compute Canada, pound Bugaboo, and you'll find uh, an endpoint that you can transfer to there. So in order to use an endpoint, you have to activate it. And it's important uh, so as to not have everybody be able to transfer uh, from your personal file space, for example, you need to be able to prove who you are at that uh, endpoint. So to activate the endpoint, you prove that you're a valid user on the system. And if you're activating a system in WestGrid, you'd use your WestGrid account name and password to activate that uh, endpoint. So for example, if I were going to log into Bugaboo, um, I would use my WestGrid password and username. Now, uh, authentication and authorization is handled by Compute Canada using something called MyProxy OAuth. And you don't need to worry about that. The only the thing to take away from here is that when you go to re uh, activate the endpoint, Globus redirects you to 
a, a, web, a consortium level web page that Compute Canada controls for authentication and authorization. So that means that you're not passing your, con your, your Westgrid or some other consortium username and password through Globus. Globus in the United States is not seeing that. All they're doing is redirecting you to a Westgrid site, which then you authenticate at, and it returns back a token which basically says it's okay for you to turn on that endpoint, Globus. So this is just, um, I would have dem demonstrated this for you live, but it saves the connection um, and it's persistent for about 13 days, so I'm actually still, still uh, authenticated. But it's a, this is just a summary of what we would have already talked about. If you go to authenticate uh, and spin up an endpoint, in this case I've got Compute Canada Silo, Silo is here at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, it's, you go to authenticate with that window and it says please authenticate to access this endpoint. And when you click continue, you'll be redirected to the endpoints login web page. So in this case, it will be the Westgrid server. So I follow the arrow and this is a screenshot of what happened next. Uh, brought up the Westgrid my proxy. You can see that it's a Westgrid site up at the top. It says Westgrid and Compute Canada. It tells you that it's OAuth. It tells you that uh, Globus is requesting access to this um, in order to activate the endpoint. So if you approve, you sign in. I signed in and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to start transferring files. Okay, so here's the point at which I'll see if I can uh, get this to work. So I'll start by signing in. I'll go slow, be sure that this is refreshed. Okay, so I'll start by, um, let's assume here that I hadn't got my endpoints activated yet. So uh, I've logged in and now uh, I want to select, uh, I want to select an endpoint that I want to start with originally. So I'll type in Compute Canada right off the start and that will filter down onto all the Compute Canada endpoints that you can see. And as I mentioned, there are about uh, 24 systems right now in Compute Canada that are available. So I'll navigate to the one that I want to find. Uh, in the first place, let's start with Silo. That's where I wanted to start my file transfer. So normally at this point, you would do the uh, authentication through OAuth. I've already done that early in the day, so it goes rather quickly. And you can see in this window that I've got, I've got my, uh, my file, win file window available to browse the contents, and I have a number of files here. All right, so let's say I want to transfer a file from Silo here at the University of Saskatchewan to Bugaboo uh, at Simon Fraser University. All right, so I'll go to Bugaboo. Nice thing about having them show up is as long as you, if, as long as you remember Compute Canada, you could pretty much find all of the, uh, all of the Compute Canada sites without having to remember the exact system name or spelling. All right, so I've got right now Silo on the left and Bugaboo on the right. And if I highlight, highlight a file here, so this is a, some sort of database file. It's about 4.2 megabytes. And you see when I, if I uh, select none, I don't, I, can, I don't have uh, a transfer highlighted. But as soon as, I, as soon as I have the appropriate directionality set, I can transfer this file over to Bugaboo. So it requests the transfer says it's successfully submitted the request and that file should be on its way. I come down here, activity, it says, excuse me, a little monitor here, it says Compute Canada, silo to Compute Canada, bugaboo. And I guess in that period of time, it was able to complete the transfer and that's completed. Uh, let me see here. I wanted to show you also the more options We've discussed the mirroring type uh, setting, transferring new and changed files, um, preserve source file modifications times. So we see that by default, checksumming is on on both sides and uh, the transfer, um, I could have encrypted the transfer if I chose it. And if I want to go to my activity browser, uh, yeah, but I'll get you to, I'll get you to Ask the question with the microphone. I would like to ask you, like, if, like, in 
If you can have the file except, for example, which has some something in the name or type, like we have, for example, this is a memory password, a lot of files which we don't want to transfer. Right. So with Axis, I can say that I don't want the file which has this name. Uh, I think that's more difficult to do from the GUI. I think it's possible to set up something like that quite easily using the command line interface. So um, it's not something that you would do from the browser, but it is possible to configure relatively easily through the CLI and through scripting. So at any rate, I just wanted to show quickly this um, activity here. We see that we transferred the file successfully um, for uh, four megs were transferred. The effective speed was very slow, three megabits a second, just simply because it was such a teeny little transfer that um, setting up the connection and tearing it down took longer. But between um, uh, earlier, I saw uh, you know, 700 megabits a second pretty easily between Silo and uh, Agaboo using, using this. So um, that is, that is uh, how easy it is to actually do the transfer. Um, so I've, that's for two pre-existing endpoints. Let me pop this up to full size here. So for two pre-existing endpoints like uh, Silo and Bugaboo, um, which have been set up for you by Compute Can administrators, it's pretty easy to move files between them. There's just an extra step. Really common use case is you have a relatively large data set on your research server or on your laptop or desktop and you want to move that, want to move a file from there onto a Compute Canada resource in order to do some sort of computation. So in that case, you'd want to use Globus Connect Personal. And so what Globus Connect Personal is, is just a client that allows your local computer or whatever you install it on to communicate with other grid FTP servers and Globus endpoints. So now you're going to be in the position where you can create your own endpoint to transfer data from, to and from your computer, and you're going to get to be able to take advantage of grid FTP rather than slow SCP uh, to do high performance transfers. Now, Globus is not magic. It's not going to make your network connection go any faster uh, from your home or from the wireless at the airport. But assuming that you have network uh, bandwidth available, Globus will try and take advantage of it as, as much of it as possible. So it's available for Mac, Linux, and Windows. And the information um, is at the Globus.org site on how to get it. There's also, um, I, there's also a link to download, uh, to download it on, um, on the main Compute Canada site. So if I go to the Start Transfer window, there's a link here which says Get Globus Connect Personal. And it's easy. Um, you follow the, steps, uh, follow the steps there in order to get Globus Connect Personal. So I didn't, um, I didn't want to bore you with actually the process of installing that. So I've already installed it on my laptop. But this is, this is the skeleton of the idea. You download and install and configure it. There's a couple of steps that you have to take. And there's detailed instructions on the Compute Canada website. Um, uh, I've got the link there for the English Globus Portal documentation. Then what you do is you activate the endpoint on your laptop or desktop. And then you can just treat your Globus, your, your newly created um, endpoint uh, on your lap, laptop or desktop as an endpoint to transfer between. So up here, I've got the little Globus G. And you can see here um, that I have already configured this so that my laptop um, is running Globus Connect Personal. And this says Haladi, Haladi uh, Pound Clabbers. Uh, as Todd pointed out, I like Scrabble. Clavers is an anagram of Scrabble, so that's the name of this, this laptop right here. So um, if I bring up a connection window, now let's go to my newly connected endpoint. Now, my endpoint no longer is Compute Canada endpoint. This is my personal laptop, so um, the endpoint starts with Haladi, and I have a few options here. I'm going to pick Haladi.clavers, which is the name of the endpoint on this machine. And it brings up a number of directories. Uh, I can now see that I have a couple of small files in here, a file to transfer. Uh, and it's as simple as 
selecting the same sort of file. So I've got too many things selected, so let me transfer. Similarly, I could queue up, I could queue up uh, this one to transfer in the other direction, and both of those transfers are, are presently going. And if you scroll down, you might be able to see that they're done. That one finished. Yeah, since they were small files, they both completed quite quickly. But I just transferred from a laptop here over the wireless um, in a seminar room to my uh, directory on Silo uh, in Compute Canada West Group. So it's a convenient feature, and um, when you start looking at large amounts of research data, having the automated restart and um, file sum checking and things can really give you a lot of peace of mind and, and save you some time. All right, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about another feature, which is sharing. So right now, I've talked about moving files that um, I own and uh, from my space into my space, uh, basically from my directories, which I own on my laptop or on another Compute Canada computer, to, uh, uh, to, to a file space which I own on another one, right? Sharing gives you a few more options. It allows you to share data with a larger uh, group of people. And it's shared exactly from where the data currently resides. So imagine a case where you had some large, uh, large data stored in a Compute Canada resource and you wanted to share that data with someone, with a research collaborator. Well, I mean, people have been getting around this for a while. Dropbox is an option, uh, burning CDs, uh, SCP. There's a, there's a number of different ways you can do it. Um, this, this meets, this, this is good for, for many use cases. So the idea is here, you have some file, user A selects uh, that file and you select a user in a group and you set some permissions um, on, on what you want to share. So Globus then tracks exactly which, which locations or which endpoints are shared and there's no need to transfer those data files to a, a secondary location. You're going to share them right from your Compute Canada location or from wherever they're currently residing. You could share these right from your, from your desktop with some other people. Then, so the first person goes out and shares the um, files second person logs into Globus without a Compute Canada account here, necessarily, and, you can, and accesses those shared files. And basically, Globus again acts as the broker here, says, okay, you have a data source, you're someone who's allowed to share um, based on the permissions that the first person set up. So um, here is, um, here's the link and, and away you go. So, Sharing allows collaborators to access files from, I'm going to speak about this on the Compute Canada website, uh, uh, or Compute Canada, excuse me, Compute Canada systems. It allows your collaborators to access files from within your Compute Canada account that you have specifically flagged for sharing on a Compute Canada system, even if they don't have an account on the system you're sharing from. And they can be shared with any Globus users anywhere in the world. So one of their, their small, uh, barrier to entry is that they need to get a Globus account. So you can set Globus permissions for who's allowed to read and write. Um, and basically, there's, there, there are a number of safeguards in place to make it more difficult to shoot yourself in the foot. Um, it's, you, you can't go and share root on a file system. You can't share somebody else's files if you don't have access to them. You can't allow somebody to write or, or share directories if the system administrators don't allow it. So in general, there are, um, uh, there are some, some safeguards to permit you uh, to, to make it more difficult to do something that you shouldn't. Nonetheless, um, and I'll talk a, few, a little bit more about caveats towards the end here, it's wise if you're interested in working with sharing to contact globus at computecanada.ca or support at westgrid.ca and we can help you get going. But I'll show you what sharing looks like here. Uh, let's see here. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of this endpoint. Um, all right, let's go up here, and I've got this Globus to share directory. So this is a this is a directory that I create uh, that I created with the um, explicit purpose of being shared. 
and this is a, a good piece of practice. You don't want to share your home directory um, outright. You create something and label it as such that it's shared and you understand that it's shared. So all I do to share is I highlight it, um, I choose share. All right, so this brings up a list of all of uh, the endpoints hosted by me on Compute Canada uh, silo. So you see right now, I already have Globus data, which is right here, shared as a shared location. But I'm saying for the purposes of this demo, I want to add a new one, and that's this Globus directory to share demo. So I'm going to go add shared endpoint, because I want to do a new one. And it gives me the option to change uh, the path. And it gives me an option to change the name. So right now, the path is just the directory I said that we wanted to share. And the endpoint name I'm going to leave alone. And I can add a you know, small description. <coughs> All right. And then I'll choose to create and manage that access. So it's creating a new share. So all that's happening now is we're not changing the files. We're not doing anything to the, to the files or to the directory. All we're doing is creating a shared endpoint, which, um, uh, which is just a, a handle that points to this uh, directory and defining some permissions to see who's allowed, uh, who's allowed to use it. So right now, the only people I'm sharing with are myself. And I have both read and write permission on this directory. That makes sense. So let's say I wanted to add uh, I wanted to add a user. So there's a number of different ways to share, and I recommend email, um, although it's possible to define more complicated groups. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, again, please contact us um, if you're interested in this sort of thing. Um, I would not use all users unless there's something. Um, I would just not use all users. <laughs> if there's an exception, you will know that there's a good reason to do it. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll pick a user, and I'll pick a, a Globus name here. Um, I happen to know one of my colleagues. Uh, and his Globus account name is SMC748. I'll search. It's Sean Cavanaugh. I also could have chosen to go via email, and that's probably a better idea uh, most of the time, to go with an email, because you in general know somebody's email. You may not necessarily know their Globus account name. Pick Sean here and use him. All right, he he is now eligible to be added to. And now here I can set his permissions, read and write. I'm going to leave him with only read permission because I only want him to be able to read the important files that I'm sharing with him. And I'm going to add permissions for him. And then you could continue to do this, and you can add groups of users. You can add single users. Um, there's a number of number of different different things you could do. All all that is required is that they need to have a Globus account. If I don't want to share with Sean anymore, I can uh, I can simply remove him, and um, he's no longer he's no longer shared with. So the other thing you want to do when you're when you're working on this, you want to communicate with the person you're sharing with, right? You want to or the people that you're sharing with, so that they know what's going on and you know what is going on, and you can be in contact, so that you're not accidentally sharing with someone who who you don't know. So let's say you don't want to share this endpoint anymore. Uh, you share with your collaborator. He downloaded the important files. And now you're done with it. You simply go to your manage, manage your endpoints. Look at my shared endpoints. I see the one that I had already running for a long time and the one I just created today. And uh, just expand it out here. And I can just delete the endpoint. So it asks, are you sure? says it's a shared endpoint, so we're going to remove the permissions for all the people you shared with, but the data isn't going to be affected at all. That makes sense. All we're doing is deleting the handle into there. We're not actually deleting any of the data. So I will with complete confidence delete that, and it's no longer, no longer shared. Okay, so um, I want to bring up a few caveats here. Sharing files does have a certain level of risk associated with it. Because the, by creating a share, you're opening up access to those files to others that up to now have been in your exclusive control in your directory. And now you're giving other people the opportunity to read those and, if you allow it, write. 
So this is, um, I mean, you you always have had the possibility to do whatever you want with your data. Um, uh, you can share it with others through a, a bunch of different means. This is just another another method. Um, so a lot of common sense applies here. You just want to make sure that you have permission to share the files, particularly if you're not the owner of those files. And you need to make sure that you're sharing only with those uh, people that you that you think you're sharing with, right? You need to verify that the people that you add to your access list are the same people that you think, because there are often people with the, with the same or similar names. Um, I was going to share a file with Lix and Lou, who works uh, in the Westgate Consortium, and there were something like 50 different Lou's, uh, which could be searched up by through the Globus interface. And a, and a good fail-safe is to use the exact email address of the person that you want to share with, unless you, have, you, unless you know their exact account name, and then even then, it's worth, it's worth verifying. Um, sharing with a group, uh, another reason I suggest that you maybe contact C Compute Canada about this um, through support and we'd be happy to help you out. If you're sharing with a group that you don't necessarily control, then you need to make sure that you trust the owner of the group because you may be happy with the current membership of the group, but they can add whoever they want to a group and suddenly you may be sharing more than you had originally intended and more than you had expected based on what you had seen when you first set up the share. If you're going to grant write access, make sure that you have um, taken precautions to be sure that your data is safe because well, as soon as you give someone write access, just like having a shared directory where multiple people write to the same place, anybody can overwrite other people's files and you can delete or overwrite files. They basically, anything that you can do through the Globus interface, they can do through the Globus interface. So it just takes common sense. People have been doing this for dozens of years. It's um, Share, sharing, sharing files is not a new thing, but the easier it becomes and the quicker it becomes, you just have to be careful to take the time to be sure that, that, you're, that you're safeguarding yourself in, uh, uh, against accidental or, or even perhaps malicious behavior. And I can't emphasize the bottom one enough, restrict your sharing to a subdirectory rather than to your top level home directory. You don't, do not want to be sharing your entire home directory with people. Set up a a contained space in which you know you're going to be sharing data from and share from there. So that's pretty much um, uh, most of what I wanted to cover about Globus today. Um, future directions briefly, we're aware that it's inconvenient to have multiple consortium accounts, one for Westgrid, one for Sharknet, one for Cynet, um, and then to have yet another account to manage with a, a Globus account. Um, we're working towards uh, single sign-on for Compute Canada and integration for single sign-on with Compute Canada and Globus accounts. And um, Compute Canada and Globus have entered into a partnership. So there is, um, uh, there is a, I think, a strong future for improved bilingualism for the Globus service right now. It, since it's been developed in the United States, it's a lot of the tie-ins are, are largely in English, but we expect that to be resolved in the coming uh, coming months. So the portal is at globus.computecanada.ca. Um, there's documentation available on the Compute Canada website in both English and French. And for any support, you can email globus at computecanada.ca or uh, support at westgrid.ca will also, will also uh, reach us as well. So with that, I guess I'll wrap up and ask if there are any questions. Marissa. Yeah. Okay, uh, I have a few questions. One, we have international collaborators that would be interested. Mm -hmm. What do they need to do for a Globus account? Is this something that they can just go through their research institution or? They can just sign up for a Globus account. You don't need any credentials. You don't need any Compute Canada. Does it cost any money? Does not cost any money. That's right. Okay. Uh, number two, do you know how this compares with the Sphera? So we've done some uh, we've done some work with uh, Spera on transferring a large uh, a large like it was a hundred terabyte data set, and we had a license which was point to point, um, and it performed very well. Um, it was. Uh, the license, the licensing terms at that time, I'm not sure if I got the most competitive quote for it, but the quote that we got sort of um, 
for a single point-to-point -point transfer was, was pretty expensive. And so this I see as a nice, I think, it, I think they could, they're both good technologies, uh, as far as I can tell. And um, this has a many-to-many -many web, which sort of um, works quite nicely for an organization like Compute Canada. Um, we have used, we have used uh, FASP with um, uh, as spare technologies to Compute Canada sites, though. So. Okay, I was meaning mainly in terms of speed. Uh, yes. Um, so we're um, network limited, I'm not technology limited. So both of them are getting network or being throttled by the, the base underlying network. Okay. And I'll hog it for one more question. Yeah. So it's it's not actually built. It's um, you do have to open up some ports, and there are some configurational changes that have to be made, and you have to get around firewalls because it opens up a range. I think I'm trying to remember, Jason Chung might be able to answer, but I think maybe forty nine thousand through fifty one thousand or something like that are needed for the base transfer. Um, okay. It's a large because it opens up a large large number of streams at once, so you need a number of ports. Okay. Good to know. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if not, thank you very much. Oh, sorry. You see? Hi, I have a question about uh, keeping files in sync. Is, so you showed us use case where you could use R sync, uh, uh, but uh, is it possible to keep two endpoints always in sync? Always in sync? So with the base configuration. No, but we've been working on um, a little bit more advanced scripting, which you could, um, which we can use in order to keep two endpoints in uh, in sync. And I mean, at the, um, it depends exactly how in sync they need to be. So if it's two within seconds, that's difficult to do because, especially since transfers need to happen. But it's pretty easy to set up something that would keep them in sync within. Um, you know, sort of an hour, uh, assuming that there's not active transfer going in there. It, it can be done on cron time scales, let's say that, modulo the data transfer time. I see. So this functionality will be available in the future in, in the, if, through GUI, through GUI? It, it is. Oh, I don't know if it's going to be available through the GUI, actually. Okay. Um, yeah. In fact, I would be inclined to say that's less likely because, um, Right now, the endpoints deactivate after a fixed amount of time, and that's determined by Globus. We have d developed a way to get around that using shared endpoints and um, then scripting, uh, scripting some stuff which now allows it to happen in the background. So it's not as easy, unfortunately, as just clicking the button and say, always keep these two directories um, synced. It's not, not quite Dropbox in that sense, Dropbox-like. Okay. Thank you. So I just wanted to clarify for myself. So say I have some files on a server or my laptop or Compute Canada, and I want to share with somebody in the U.S. who does not have a, a, a Compute Canada but can have a, a global account, as you said. So am I able to transfer files to that person's server or computer, or I can just share files with them? You can you can share files with them, and what they would do is they log into Globus. You give they they take your shared endpoint, um, and they would download the files directly from wherever they live. Oh, so there's no direct like transfer to to a server. Okay. Well, I'm trying to figure out. Uh, I guess if they set up a shared endpoint on their site. Um, you could then initiate that direct transfer to them. That's not impossible, assuming that they, they subscribe to the, the Globus Plus model, which allows sharing. Um, yeah. Thank you. It's technically possible. All right, any other questions from any sites? I don't see any uh, online. 
Last chance going once, twice. All right, thank you all for attending. Uh, Jason, thank you very much for a great talk. And uh, we will see you again in a couple of weeks for the next in our series of Westford seminars. Thank you. Thanks.